to a special PAX West edition of our skewed cast. Our normal weekly skewed cast, as you know, takes place on Sundays, but because it's a holiday weekend, and Genevieve and I are in the Seattle area, this weekend we'll be covering PAX West. Justin is out of town as well, so Michael and I are doing the show this week. And uh, you can catch us each week at escape.net every day with our updates. Catch me weekly on BJ Shea's Geek Nation on KISWFM, or go to Pinal Central, P I N A L Central.com, and keyword skewed. Look up our newspaper articles. We have a really nice um, review for Iron Fury up this week. And of course, there's our quarterly magazine. We're getting ready for the new issue of September. Skewed and reviewed the magazine, and uh, we have a lot of great stuff to uh, share with that very soon. But as we said, we're going to be talking PAX West right now. And uh, I was uh, there with Genevieve and uh, Joseph and a few, uh, Neil and a few of the other staff. Uh, Michael was not, but he uh, was doing remote coverage. He also covered a lot of these titles we're going to talk about at E3 with me. So we're going to be doing our uh, reflections and comments. So uh, starting off, the first thing, literally, um, so here we are, 9 o'clock opening, okay? And uh, the way they worked it this year was for the first 30 minutes, press get a half hour head start. Now, this is a change from the fact that usually press gets in at nine on the first day. We go until 10, then they let the public in regular time for everybody the rest of the show. So this year they decided they're going to give uh, press a half hour head start each day. So uh, 940, we're still standing in line waiting to go in. Vendors are going through in and out. Exhibitors are going in and out, but all of us are standing in line waiting for the fire marshal to give the AOK to open the door. So they open the doors, they let all the ADA line in, they let the press in, and hot on our heels was the uh, general public. So you can guess uh, how the mood was by a lot of people in the media. Yeah, I can imagine. So, yeah. So, anyway, we made our first stop as we used the PlayStation booth. And that turned out to be, as usual, a very good walked in there. I saw this jungle motif, and I go, oh, what's that? And you know we've been discussing what were they going to have and what would their return be like. And we walked over, and boom, there it was, Predator Hunting Grounds. And we walked right up, boom, got to play. And they were fantastic about letting us do video, letting us do pictures, and uh, we even got a nice T-shirt when it was all done. So... The trick is basically it's a squad based combat game. And what you do is you, you know, go in, you pick your class, and there's like assault and tech and so on and so forth. And it's a PlayStation exclusive. I should mention that. So you go through, one person plays as the Predator, everyone else on the fire team plays as humans. You do your loadout. And there were various hot spots like go to this camp and you could do, um, various raids, various attacks, that sort of thing. Now, the thing I wasn't prepared for was there were also NPC enemy units. I was just, like, getting a predator. And so what I did was there were numerous gas cans all over the place. I kept blowing them up, trying to throw off his heat vision. Because the only time I ever saw him was occasionally you'd see a targeting laser come out. So I had to cut through a bunch of NPC players. And of course, you know me, shooters, mouse and a keyboard, uh, so on and so forth. But you would do things like find a computer, restore power, uh, get to a checkpoint, revive down teammates, stuff like that. And and then what happened was I took out a garbage, uh, a can. It blew up. I was I didn't see the explosive that was uh, lobbed in and with all the fire and it knocked me unconscious. The predator came down, took out all of my crew, and that was all she wrote. But we do have an extended gameplay after that. And it was uh, the videos up at SKNR.net. They got two sets of it. Uh, one's about a, um, almost two minutes. The other one's about seven and a half minutes. So you can get a pretty good idea for the game. So, Michael, did you get a chance to look that over? And if you did, what did you think? Yeah, so I did a quick review of it. I looked over some of the other articles uh, about it that they had posted, and I'm ex- I'm still excited for it. I think it looks uh, really good. I mean, I, I mean, it is a for something that kind of came out of the blue, which I don't really think we were expecting uh, to to hear much about. And then all of a sudden, we heard about a new Predator game coming out. 
I think all in all, I think it's it's it. I like the take on it. I like um, I like how it looks so far. I'm pretty excited to pl- to get some hands on myself. So all in all, I was actually pretty impressed with it, given the fact that there was not a lot of buzz outside of when it was announced, and we weren't really sure how much we would of, of Sony's um, Sony's experience we'd get to see again, especially since they've been so quiet about in development titles and, and stuff that's coming out for Sony PlayStation. So all in all, I think, uh, I, yeah, I'm pretty excited for it still. I think I'm really hoping it'll kind of uh, revigorate the franchise a bit. I know there's been a little bit of uh, concern whether or not the Predator franchise, you know, if we're going to see new movies come out of it with the Disney Fox thing going on. So I hope this kind of adds some excitement and fuel to that fire and maybe gets us uh, some more buzz going around the Predator as, uh, franchise as a whole. And I find it uh, really interesting, too, you mentioned the Disney Fox thing, because, um, you know, I'm curious how this worked out. If it was something that was put into motion beforehand, I I assume it was. But at the same time, they had to know that uh, Disney was maneuvering to take the reins. It's still an early build of the game. But it was something we only heard about a couple of months ago. And then all of a sudden, boom, here's a playable thing. And I'll, I'm being very honest here. They went all out. This was the this was the centerpiece of their thing. They had a Death Stranding uh, exhibit with uh, some stuff, but this was the big, well decorated, large, right as you walked in thing. They even had a predator uh, that would come out and do photo ops and stuff throughout the day. So they, you know, they went in all all in on this now. The next thing that they had that got a lot of attention was they had Iron Man VR. Now, there were two stations of this, and uh, we got in there, and we were very fortunate because we got out there early. And I want to say within, we were standing in line, and this is all still within, I'd say, the first half hour of the show with the doors opening. And they walked up, and they were like, okay. And we waited maybe 10 minutes or so, and they walked me in, and uh, Joseph went in behind me. And what they did was they, they you stand for it, which was a little weird. And so the best way I could try to imagine it is, as you would expect, your Iron Man. So they put the move controllers in your hand. Those are your hand thrusters. So, like, if you want to go up, you put them straight down at your side. And that lifts you up in the air. And there's like a command you can hit to do a double boost or like a scoot side to side. You want to go forward. You have to put your hands down to lift up. And then you angle your hands backward to be your jet to give you propulsion. You can hover, but then you use the trigger on it. You have to raise your hand up and use the trigger to fire. So one of the tricks that we had to do was you had to uh, fly around, hit various targets. A little bit to get used to of okay i'm going to turn this way and of course you could turn around 360 and all of that i actually have the cord going around my leg a couple of my foot a couple of times but then you had the combat situations and then you could also punch as well and i know joseph got so disoriented he said he actually punched and hit the wall because oh, no. was, uh, <laughs> hitting the target. but it was a lot of fun because once you get the hang of it well it will take some challenge to to get you know fluent with the flying and stuff it was really cool to be able to put your hands right down and shoot up in the air like iron man hold one like that put the other one behind to spin and that sort of thing and then hand out repulsor blast repulsor blast so um you know got through the tutorial and looking forward to seeing what they have with it yeah what i've seen at least from the 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 stuff that i've read and stuff that i've known about is they say it's actually pretty intuitive um, one of the things about VR in general, in my experience, is flight simulators, which I guess this kind of falls into that category, um, tend to be a little bit better VR experiences, again, because you kind of have that 360 degree motion. You're not trying to climb up ladders and, and stuff like that. And it, from what I've seen, it looks like the controls are pretty intuitive um, from a from a usability standpoint for PlayStation VR. I mean, I've heard people... You know, some of the stuff I've read is they've even said that, you know, it makes a good introduction to VR as a whole because it's it's something that you can kind of pick up and kind of intuitively get the gist of how things work with it. And so, again, I'm, I, what I really like is that Sony continues to double down on their VR experience. I mean, not, you know, we've seen, you know, Oculus and Vive and, and some of those and they continue to kind of, you know, 
move forward with the VR stuff, uh, iterating the hardware, that sort of thing. But Sony definitely continues to really push the boundaries of what their VR hardware can do. One of the things that I really hope to hear more about, we've kind of talked about uh, the VR2 coming out uh, with the new uh, PlayStation on the horizon. What What I'm hoping to do personally is I think one of the bigger Achilles heels um, for PlayStation VR in general is the move controllers that, that they, they're kind of getting aged. Um, they 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 work, and it sounds like for this game they work pretty well. But I really am interested to see what kinds of uh, new control schemes we can see. So I think if we start to see this with maybe a PlayStation Five uh, or a VR two announcement, maybe we see some better control schemes. I think all in all, this is a really good opportunity to show off what VR is capable of. So uh, pretty been pretty excited about what little photos, photo and video I've seen of it and what I've read about it and looking forward to kind of getting some hands on with that myself. Yeah. And the interesting thing about it too, was there were some other VR titles I didn't get a chance to see. They were the more casual games and stuff like that. They had, um, the remaster of medieval. They had a couple of other games like Genevieve played dreams, which had been, um, you know, announced years ago at E3 and is starting to come around and she was really impressed with what she saw of that. I played a game, I forget exactly the title of it, but it was a Heroes game. And uh, what you did, and this is great, it was like a two-player, um, kind of a co-op bash situation where you go through and you smash skeletons and monsters and then get chest and you can upgrade your weapon and you can upgrade your armor. And they had a lot of really clever characters. They were like foxes and geckos and rabbits and stuff. And I, my character was a, a gecko named Ollie. And the cool thing about it was I kept wondering, they kept saying it was a two-on-two situation. So my teammate and I got through everything, got through the end of uh, the level, and then it became a two-on-two challenge mode. And what we had was a block of ice with these fish heads swimming around in the water, and it was like hockey. We had to um, essentially shoot sushi into the mouth of certain fish while keeping them from shooting fish heads into our mouth. And at that point, we could combat each other and body check and that was a lot of fun. It was a casual title. And what was really fun was that Sony, um, the reps were really great. The The people they had there, they were, we were talking in line with them at, um, at, with Iron Man VR. And we, you know, I mentioned how much we missed seeing them there at uh, E3. And they were asking questions like this. And, you know, it was really tough not being there and stuff like that. And one of them asked, he said, what did they do with our space? So I kind of explained to him how the layout was and how unusual the whole thing not to see them in the Microsoft booth right next to each other. And so right. we, we had a good conversation about that. It just generally seemed like they were really eager to be engaged with the public again. And, uh, you know, moving on to some of the other titles, we played uh, Borderlands 3, which, uh, as you know, we played that at E3. It was the uh, same build, same uh, same mission, but I, I did take the guy out this time. <laughs> so uh, well, that's better than I did least, last time. So. <laughs> I think I did. Let me let me be clear on that. He was um, down to a really low level of health. I jumped in the air and shot him in the head, and all of a sudden the screen flashed up. The mayhem continues on. You know, ten, they didn't have to come and say, "Okay, time's up" or anything like that. So, all right. Who who knows? Uh, who knows? But we went through that, played a lot of stuff, um, played an interesting casual game upstairs called Moving Out. We, they, um, You haven't been to PAX, so you wouldn't uh, quite grasp this, but they have the main floor split into two sides. But when you go up to the next level, they have a lot of smaller booths. They have a lot of uh, smaller independent companies. Um, you will occasionally see like EVGA had several tables up there in an annex. You have a lot of board games up there, but mostly they're very small indie game companies up top. And there was this one we saw called Moving Out, and it was uh, it was quite funny. It was a four player co op game where you play movers that have to uh, essentially clear houses. And the one we had was a haunted house. So we had to avoid the ghosts. Sometimes the furniture or items would become animated and would move away from us. So we had to like grab them. You have to hold them, move them out and avoid the ghost. And I remember we had this one chair that was stuck in a room that we couldn't get to because the ghost was guarding the door. You had to run away from the door, then run back to open it. He would chase you around. And one of the guys grabbed the chair. Now, of course, it moves slow on your own, but if you have more people helping you, you go fast. 
He uh, literally took the chair and broke the window with it, jumped out the second story window and ran into the moving van with it. So, oh, wow. Yeah, it was it was fun. I mean, we were sitting there going, this is one that we hadn't expected. And very casual, very uh, small company, but a lot of talk. But, um, you know, as we moved on, of course, there were uh, bigger things. And the next thing I wanted to talk about was Google Stadia. So, Michael, why don't you explain what Stadia is? Yeah, so what I mean, what I know of Google Stadia uh, with the talk is it's Google's. Uh, at first, it, was, it sounded like it was going to be Google's response to a Netflix type um, genre, but the, ideally, what it's supposed to be is bringing streaming of high quality, high definition games um, to your devices, right? Whether that be a phone, a tablet, your T big screen TV. The idea being that all the uh, processing power, all the graphical power. All the games, the games themselves, everything is held uh, offsite via the quote unquote the cloud, right? And then what that allows you to do is stream your games anywhere you are. So if you you know you're in bed and you want to play on your um, phone, you can stream it to your phone. If you want to play on your tablet, you can play on your tablet. Um, I do know that they're going to be releasing uh, with a, a game pad type controller uh, and that sort of thing that kind of allows you, I assume it's Bluetooth, allows you to connect to multiple devices. Uh, and I do know that they were going to offer that as a, you know, it's not not really the Netflix idea that I, we initially thought, I, for what I had heard is you, they're going to allow you to purchase games via the service, but those games will be available to you on any device, anywhere, anytime. The idea being instead of having a dedicated PC that you need to upgrade to play the latest game that supports ray tracing you're going to be playing off of their servers um, a lot of the questions that i've had around it um, without actually seeing it firsthand or or being able to play with it is you know how's lag what's the lag going to be like what are the load screens going to be like what are the delays going to be like so those are the things that i know about google stadia so i'm very excited to kind of get your take on the actual physical experience of what google stadia represented well it was it was an interesting thing. So basically, they said it's not like Netflix or anything like that. They showed us the and they kind of said, then they kind of mentioned, but the kit to sign up includes the controller. So the way I get the impression, I got was the controller is the hardware, and you connect that controller to a wireless. Uh, set up or whatever you're using. Now, they had mentioned like they have a, a combo pack, the controller, uh, like a switching box, and three months of the service. And it was very odd because we played Doom Eternal on a screen and then we played Mortal Kombat 11 on a phone. Now, they uh, were talking to us as a meeting and we were told. No lag time. So I let Joseph play Doom Eternal since I had played it at E3. I th thought it'd be fun to get his impression. So after he got smacked down, he handed it over to me. And they had just said, oh, yeah, no, no, no load screens. And they had 4K graphics and 60 frames a second, no load screens. So I'm sitting there going, I can't get the game to start. And all of a sudden I heard, oh, well, it's loading. Oh, great. And it's like, okay. So, you know, I sat there and I played it. It played fast. Loose. I mean, I didn't notice any difference between the version of that and then the one we played at E3. It was very quick. It was very smooth. It looked good. Um, he played Mortal Kombat 11 on the phone. Joseph said it, you know, looked good, played fine as well. But, you know, I asked some hard questions to the guys. And I wish we would have been allowed to videotape uh, it because... Uh, they they appreciated the hard questions, but like uh, you know, they said, "Well, there's no subscription service. You buy the games like you do through any thing. They have their they're going to have their store, obviously, and that sort of thing." And so, of course, my thoughts on how many games are going to be available. We know about Doom Eternal. We know about this, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, I, I was telling Joseph, I said, "You look at something like." I, is available to these guys. I don't see my, uh, Microsoft making their exclusives. I don't see Nintendo making their exclusives available to them. Because why would they? Then? You know that defeats the whole purpose. Uh, buy our uh, play these exclusives. You got to buy our hardware. 
And so based PC games, and I can see them saying, okay, it's, you know, it's not going to be a problem. We can do that. But my big concern was essentially what I'm seeing is that you get this controller and it connects to uh, any kind of Wi-Fi device, and then you connect into their service that you pay a monthly subscription to access. Now, their whole point is you don't need to buy a four or $500 console in or- order to play this. And I'm thinking, okay, or a, you know, a loaded PC, and I get that, that's a, that's a grand idea. My other problem though is, I'm not a, I'm not someone that uses a console controller and they, I think they were kind of hinting that if you want, you can use a mouse and a keyboard and they, they had kind of implied that. And I said, okay, that's fine. But you know, my whole thing was you're showing me this under very controlled situations. And you know, how do I know you don't have a T3 line or something hooked up here and there's not any kind of lag or any kind of latency, but it's like, what happens when I'm sitting at home and I'm trying to hook this thing up? Uh, am I going to have problems accessing the servers? Are we going to have problems downloading the thing? Is it on a standard DSL connection or a basic cable connection for most people? Is it going to have this kind of latency? And I, I, I even asked him, I said, so what happens when I'm on a multiplay game and someone else has got a really bad connection? I'm not going to get 4K in 60 frames a second. And he kind of was like, well, okay, yeah, you've got this, you've got this, and it could do that, and it, it'll do this. Say, it'll up their connection, but you're also patient that, well, everybody will be set at a standard. And I kind of got the idea of that's because, again, you know, he, he kind of said, well, yeah, if you're playing a guy in Finland, you might get this, if you get this, and I, and so my, my take on it was it's a very interesting idea, but number one, I want to see how reliable is it going to be connecting, how many titles are going to be on that service. And, you know, at the end of the day, I looked at it and said, I've got a PS4 and a loaded PC. I don't have any need for this. Um, you know, maybe the whole idea of being able to play on the go, that's appealing. But I mean, seriously, if I go into um, if I go into a hotel, I'm not going to be able to hook that thing up to their television. I'm going to have to be doing it over my laptop. To be honest, when I'm traveling, how often do we have to sit down and play games when we're going off to these business meetings? Yeah, so, and, the, and the other thing that I can I'm concerned about is the bandwidth utilization. I've heard some things that there's nine gigabytes an hour. Um, so we're talking. There are still a lot of now. I'm lucky in that my my cable provider I have unlimited bandwidth, but that's not the case for a lot of folks anymore. Exactly. Um, so if we're talking now we have to you have to take into consideration not only this the streaming aspect the speed um the usability of it all but now we're also talking about bandwidth utilization because as we know and again i i get it's not streaming like netflix right but we know netflix bandwidth utilization is significantly less and so we're talking not only potentially running into bandwidth caps playing games i mean do you want to limit yourself to um two hours a day to play video games or an hour a day to play video games or three times a week. Um, and then what, what are you going to be running into as far as how does that impact everybody else that you're sharing that bandwidth with? Is it, if you're playing games in your room and your wife is watching Netflix, is her Netflix experience now going to be, um, delayed loading lag time or your game for that matter, because you guys are trying to share that bandwidth. Uh, I like the idea. I mean, I, I've always been a real big, fan of streaming my thing though is i can already do that and again this is my experience i realize not everybody's in the same boat but using like geforce experience i can already stream to um an android tablet i can already stream stream to my shield on a on a separate computer or on a tv using their shield device i have other other programs that allow me to stream to my apple ipad so there are other things out there that allow me to to utilize the experience without paying for it in any way again i realize i made i might be in the minority there but again i'm still utilizing my my processing power my bandwidth power local wi-fi for the most part although i can stream at a hotel if i want to game wise but again that experience even off of my local system is iffy and doing that over 
uh, hotel Wi-Fi, as you know, even when we're in uh, hotels, sometimes uploading videos to the website or, or, or you know, it, it's not that even isn't isn't a, a something an experience that's good. Um, Netflix eh, can be hit or miss, but something like like this that's going to require a bunch of bandwidth. I can see that being already a problem. So uh, while I do appreciate, I like the innovation of the idea. I appreciate what they're trying to do. Um, that's one of my issues. The other issue I have is um, I, I don't necessarily like to buy the game for the full price from them and you're utilizing their service to play it. So obviously for PC gamers that are going to buy the game, they're likely going to buy it on PC anyways, right? They're not going right. to pay the $60 for Doom to be able to stream it all sort. Maybe they will for having another copy. But I don't like the idea that you're paying a full price for a product that, let's face it, if you don't use their their hardware or if they fold in the next year or two, I'm not saying they will because Google has a lot of money behind this, but if they do, you don't transfer those games anywhere. Let's you know that was that was a big concern initially, I think, with Steam. It's a concern with you know epics and some of these other streaming services, right? Is that while I buy the game there, what happens to the game if they fold? Well, you lose it, right? Yeah. Steam Steam has enough clout in the industry. And they've been around long enough that we, I feel pretty confident paying full price for a game on Steam. Knowing that, yeah, maybe I'll play it initially, but if I want to come back to it five years later, it's still going to be there. Um, right. Stadia, I, I can't now and maybe this will change in a year or two but for early adopters this is going to be a big deal um again i would have preferred a netflix subscription type service where you say hey you pay 15 dollars a month you get access to this library of games that you can play for your 15 dollars a month and oh if it folds in six months eight months you're out what 15 bucks a month that you spent on it not a big deal if i went and spot 10 games on their service let's say i want to play the new doom and i don't have a pc and i don't have a console I pay the sixty dollars for it. Let's say the experience is not great on my plus home. a monthly subscription. Let's plus the month that. plus the monthly subscription. Let's say that let's say the experience is not great um, for that game on my on the state, or I decide I don't want to pay the monthly subscription in three months. I just lost, I'm just out the sixty bucks for the game that I can never play again without re-upping the monthly subscription. So I really question that as a offering i guess that's my biggest concern with stadia i like the idea of being able to stream it to multiple devices i like the idea of being able to play my games remotely if i'm at a friend's house i like the idea of having my games on the go i don't like the the offering i don't i don't like the you pay full price for the game and you pay the subscription price and oh we can't guarantee your experience because we it's going to differ for your bandwidth oh and you're also going to be potentially limited by the ability for um, your service provider to limit that bandwidth. Let's not forget that with the net neutrality cancellation, um, now cable companies such as Comcast, Cox, um, AT&T, Verizon, whomever, now have the ability to say, hey, you guys are sucking up too much of my bandwidth, so we're going to artificially limit your bandwidth on our devices for Stadia or for Google because you guys are, because your game players are, making the experience for Netflix worse for the other subscribers who are sharing your bandwidth. So there are a lot of things that, yes, on an ideal situation um, where you're using a dedicated fiber link to Google, that you're going to have a great experience. I'm not saying that the experience isn't possible, but I think there's right now too much up in the air for me to commit to saying, hey, I would be willing to pay for this service and again, I realize I'm not the person that they're targeting. You're not the person necessarily they're targeting. They're targeting for folks who don't want to put out the money for a good gaming PC. They don't want to put out the money for a console. I get it. But ultimately, you're paying the price from a bandwidth perspective. You're paying a price from your service provider. You're paying the price from their subscription service. And you're not getting a discount on the games either. Uh, so I think it's a hard sell. I, 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 I'm excited for it. I hope it – I'd like to see what they do with it, but I really am – not convinced of the of the process or the service that they're going forward with. Yeah, and here's another thing that just kept gnawing at me. Uh, like you and I would get our codes, we get our you know codes for reviews and stuff, Steam or Epic or whatever. We're not going to go out and buy an additional thing. And I thought about it and I go, 
how many hardcore gamers are there out there that don't have a gaming system? How many casual gamers are there that don't have a gaming system? I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, of course, not everybody has, um, you know, not everybody has a PC. But if you went out there and you said, okay, gamers, how many of you, you know, how many of you got have an Xbox? How many of you have a PS4? How many of you have a PC? Okay. How many of you have a Switch? Now, how many of you want to play games, but you can't afford that? And see, I, I just, I keep coming back to that. I'm not trying to be mean here, but if you can't afford $300 for a console, are you going to be able to afford $15 a month for, or whatever it is for the uh, online fee, plus the $70 for the control, plus buy-in games that way i mean i know it's cheap it's it's cheaper but the argument might be i can go out and pick out a used console for about two hundred dollars there's several games that i could get cheap uh that are um if i want to play online i can i can join playstation plus xbox gold get free games get two free games a month to replenish my stock you know it just I, I, you know, I'm coming back to it. It basically is coming down to if you want to play PC, if you don't have a console, you you can't afford a console, you can't afford a high end PC, but you essentially want to play PC games because we've already talked about the issues with console exclusives. Um, you know, I I think it's a I think it's a small market because well, I, I think. I mean, and to top, I agree with you. And to top it all off, when we start talking about those individuals, now we're saying, are those individuals paying the high price for a good internet connection? You know, and the are, answer is no. Right. If they're if they're not, I I can't Cause, cause I can't think of anybody it unless they're right unless they're streaming movies or downloading, you know, down unless they're downloading movies, streaming movies, you know, like I know Netflix will let you go on. And you can download the movies and stuff like that. But see, again, if you've got that high-end internet speed, generally you're a gamer as well, and you have the hardware. Right, yeah. If you're playing in 4K on your 4K TV, are you? do you really want to play your four games in 4K without a console? And that I... was the other thing I kept wondering, going, okay, if you've got a 4K television, you probably have a console. You know, it's, I don't, hear many stories of gamers with 4k televisions who don't have in fact that's the reason most people bought a 4k television is when the enhanced xboxes and the enhanced playstation came out that offered the checkerboarding you know beyond 1080 so they can say, and, they, and they're sitting there going we're looking forward to the next generation of consoles so crazy stuff there yep. moving on to way before we get to the uh the um, next big title is that we did have a private off-site event for Elder Scrolls Online Dragonhold. Um, really nice event. They had uh, some very good food and drinks and stuff. They even had a specialized Elder Scrolls uh, Jones Soda that was made by local Jones Soda for it. Uh, got to have a look at it. They got to play it. We're going to have a full recap soon. It was really interesting because we were given some photos to put up after the event. And they started popping up on Reddit, people going, I thought Bethesda wasn't at PAX. How did these things get up here? Are they all under non-disclosures? And I had to like go in and say, no, there was an off-site press-only event. Uh, but, you know, it was like a 90-minute window where they invited all various members of the press to come. And there you go. Uh, we did an interview with Life is Strange 2 for with co-creative director Michelle Cook. And then finally, we ended the day, Michael, with something, or ended the bulk of the, the coverage. We have, of course, plenty more with indies, but for our purposes, the AAA titles. Uh, we got a hands-on with the new Avengers game. Now, you and I saw the booth and the displays at PAX West, uh, excuse me, at E3, but this time it was the first ever chance that the media was allowed to play it. So uh, essentially we ran through, uh, as an Avengers day, Something happens, and we ran through various characters. Started off playing as Thor, and I got to tell you, it was very satisfying to take the hammer 
smack people into next week. Um, flying through the air, the combat gave me a little bit of memory for um, Arkham Asylum and that free-flowing cre- allowed you to be creative. Uh, next up was Iron Man. You can guess the combat was very different. Repulsor beams, they all have like a superpower. Uh, mine was the chest cannon that when I fired out of the chest plate, I could carve things up like crazy. Went to the Hulk next, and that was great because he could leap, he could grab enemies, and you could like hit enemies with, with an enemy while you're holding them. Uh, there was the big thunderclap to clear things. Uh, after that, it was Captain America, and as you can guess, Captain America was a lot of shield throws, melee moves, uh, acrobatic stuff, and then Black Widow used a lot of um, tumbles, a lot of flips, and of course, the double pistols, and uh, some hooks and stuff like that. So it was very interesting, very quick, very free-flowing, and loved what we saw. It was a pre-alpha version, of course. And then we were given a Q&A session, uh, basically where we were told the story of the game, uh, how things happen, and that when the game uh, launches, there'll be essentially a screen, and you can choose to do the solo play things, which are the campaign, and then there's an up to four person co op thing. But of course, the skills and points you get on these missions, either solo or co op, are transferable to upgrade your character, to access new characters, and then of course, as you would expect, there will be the store to unlock and to purchase all kinds of customizations and such. And they said, you know, they kept talking how they are celebrating 80 years of Marvel with this game. So I'm I'm expecting uh, some really interesting things down the road. But I have to say it was an extremely pleasant surprise. Uh, we had four of us playing it. My wife absolutely loved it. Uh, the rest of the crew loved it. And I was really, really impressed with it. And I thought this is going to be a lot of fun when it comes out. So one of the questions I have regarding the experience uh, there's been a lot of concern or questions or anger honestly about the character models how did you feel did, did that kind of melt away did, was that as noticeable when you're in there yeah, playing the game not so bad i mean honestly okay thor looked like thor but not like chris hemsworth um same thing for black widow look like black widow doesn't look like scarlett johansson but um you know they were close enough i mean let's, let's consider Look at, uh, you know, the Ultimate Alliance games. Do those look like, do the characters in Ultimate Alliance 3 look like the film versions of themselves? Exactly. Yeah, I, I right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, there you go. I felt this way. You're not, you know, you have to remember, there's all sorts of licensing issues that pop up with these things. You know, I, I remember, it's kind of like the whole thing with the movies when, I remember what Uva Boll and Chris Roberts and all these people told me, like, look at the Wing Commander movie. You could use the title, but you couldn't make, couldn't make the ships look like they do in the games. Couldn't make the Kilrathis look like they do in the games. Couldn't use any of the storylines in the games or anything that might be a future storyline. So they had to come up with all this garbage about pilgrims and so on and so forth, because essentially they wanted to do a Wing Commander movie but they couldn't make it tie into the games in any way, shape, or form. And this is one of the reasons that a lot of video game-based movies fail. And I think this is one of the problems with the uh, expectations of fans for superhero games. There have been so many interpretations of the heroes over the years. They cannot make them look exactly like the heroes uh, that are most recently portraying them on the screen in some I mean, look at Batman. I mean, that was changing almost film to film in many cases until Christian Bale did his trilogy. I mean, what did we get? Two with Keaton, one with Val Kilmer, yep. one with George Clooney. So who, who is the who is the Batman model they should have used for Arkham Asylum? You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. And I think that's basically what they went with is they, you know, there there are rooms, there are rooms to change. It's only in pre-alpha. So if they decide somewhere down the road, We need to make these things look like Hemsworth. We need to make these things look like Evans and Scarlett Johansson. There you go. But see, then again, you also run into the problem of just how close can you make them before it becomes an issue that all of a sudden you've got to pay them. And then if you're going to make them look like them, you might as well pony up and get them to do the voiceover work. But you know they're not going to do that because that costs money. So there you go. I mean, well, let's. I mean, let's not forget how, like NCAA football, for example, that's a good from EA. That's a good example where we had players coming out saying, "Well, they look like me, so now uh, you have to pay me, right?" 
NCAA violations. And what did EA say? Well, we're not going to bother with it anymore because we don't want to deal with this. So I agree. I mean, as soon as you start tweaking the character models too much, you have to make them distinct enough so that they don't get confused with the individuals that were portraying them. Otherwise, you get into the, do you need to pay me for royalties? This looks too much like my image. My image is a is a, a copyright or a, a you know trademark, so you have to pay me for that. So I agree. I mean, you have to kind of draw the line at some point. Exactly. And see, but what I said was very impressive. But I mean, some people were sitting there going, oh, my God, how, how can you sit there and you know, oh, it's going to have DLC. It's going to have paid content. Well, of course it does. You know, they they were showing pictures of like uh, some of the like the Hulk in various costumes and various ensembles. Well, number one, no one's forcing you to do that. I mean, if you don't want the Hulk in a zoot suit, you don't need to put the Hulk in a zoot suit. If you want to just play the game and do that, now the, you know, the big question will be: uh, Well, if I need to unlock this power to get through a level. I did not get any implication of that. It seemed very uh, straight up. It seemed very, uh, you know, very clear what you were going to get for your uh, core game, what you were going to get with the additional stuff. So I, you know, no issues at all. I was quite impressed with what I saw. Uh, like I said, we saw some stuff from EVGA, Razor, so on and so forth. And we'll have more recaps coming. So, Michael, anything else you want? No, I think that's a that's a lot of coverage and a lot. I mean, you got got to see a lot, and I was glad that Sony put on a good show. I, you know, we've been kind of worried about them uh, without the E3 and the PlayStation Experience stuff going on. So I was glad that they were open and and you know and were that were there and were showing off some stuff. So all in all, I think it's turned out to be really good for them. All right, well, that's the we're going to be uh, back next week, and. Um on Sunday and hopefully recording at our regular time with the full cast until then folks take care and